I thank everyone for joining. This is Gina Parzial, the Executive Director for the Alport Syndrome Foundation. We are very grateful today to Dr. James Simon. He is a staff nephrologist at Cleveland Clinic, and he is also a member of the Alport Syndrome Foundation Medical Advisory Committee. He will be speaking today about dialysis and kidney transplantation. If you have any questions, if you are participating live, you are welcome to ask them on the participant feedback section online or at the end of the call, I will be unmuting all call as so you'll be able to ask your questions directly. If you are viewing this after uh, the recording on our website, you can email any questions that you have to info at alportsyndrome.org. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. James Simon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you this afternoon. Uh, I've been asked to discuss probably the least pleasant aspect of Alport syndrome, which is going on to kidney failure and what to do after that. Um, so we'll talk about dialysis and kidney transplantation and what you can expect from those. The first thing, I want to just lay a little groundwork in case people hadn't been involved with um, some of the other webinars and talk just about chronic kidney disease. And it's important to get good chronic kidney disease care even if the, you eventually do go on to kidney failure because it helps, uh, it, it helps make the transition smoother. So obviously in this case, people diagnosed with Alport syndrome, the cause of kidney dysfunction is known, although there are some patients who carry a diagnosis of Alport syndrome but may have diabetes or other problems that may be contributing to kidney dysfunction. And uh, point number two about trying to slow the progression of kidney disease, uh, we obviously can't stop it yet in Alport syndrome, but proper use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs is, is number one for patients with Alport syndrome to try to slow the progression of the kidney dysfunction down. And then as you develop what we call chronic kidney disease or impaired kidney function, it's important that your nephrologist not just focus on your Alport syndrome, but also recognize that he, they need to take care of the other issues that arise with chronic kidney disease. And the number one risk is, is heart health, cardiovascular health. Uh, there is an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes with decreased kidney function. So we often will focus on your blood pressure, although Alport syndrome patients, uh, a lot of them being younger, may not have high blood pressure issues but cholesterol, stricter cholesterol control, and some people develop anemia and some other problems. And then lastly, as the kidney function declines, it's important to be engaged with your nephrologist to help prepare for kidney failure so you know what to expect. And a, a review of what we call the stages of chronic kidney disease, and those go by your percent kidney function or your GFR. So stage three chronic kidney disease is a GFR of 30 to 60%. Now there are stage one and stage two, and you would have those with the blood in your urine or protein in your urine when your kidney function is greater than 60. Uh, most other people don't get diagnosed in those stages and they fall right into stage three. Stage four, what we call pre-dialysis, is uh, 15 to tw um, 30, excuse me, there's a typo there, 15 to 30, and then stage five is less than 15. And stage five is, uh, is basically about the time that people, many people start dialysis once they get under 15%. For Alport syndrome, as we discussed, the importance of being on an ACE inhibitor or an A or B can't be uh, emphasized enough. And it's important to try to stay on those medicines as long as possible because they've been shown to delay the progression of kidney disease to kidney failure, at least in certain populations with Alport syndrome. One of the drawbacks of these medicines is they can elevate the potassium level. And potassium is an electrolyte it's a, or a mineral that's cleared out by the kidneys. It's in lots of healthy foods. And once your kidney function gets down below 30, a lot of people start having problems with elevated potassium levels. That may not be a problem unless it gets too high. If it, if it gets very high, the potassium can cause problems with your heart. So your, your doctor should be monitoring that. And sometimes the ACE inhibitors or ARBs may, uh, need to be stopped because of this. But there are low potassium diets and there are certain medications now that can be used to control the potassium to help you remain on the ACE inhibitor ARB. And those are things to keep in mind. 
so that you can try to stay on the ACE inhibitor or ARB as long as possible. And then the most important point, and I can't underemphasize this because it's going to impact the rest of our talk, is you have to be engaged as a patient with your care. You have to talk with your nephrologist and under, understand where your GFR is, what stage of kidney disease you're in, and how fast it's declining. And then know what should be done at each stage. Ask them if, if we're doing everything we, we need to do to help um, stabilize things or prepare you for kidney failure, especially when you reach that GFR of less than 30. And you know the, the converse to being engaged is don't pretend it isn't happening. Uh, too many patients say they don't want to think about it, or they'll talk to you about it next time, or they really don't want to do dialysis, you need it. And if we aren't prepared, if we're not thinking about this ahead of time, it makes starting dialysis much harder on you, uh, and it also makes it less likely that you'd be listed for a transplant. Unfortunately, we, we know with have many patients with Alport syndrome that they're going into kidney failure, so we have time to prepare. It shouldn't be a surprise for most patients, uh, unless you're diagnosed with Alport syndrome already when the kidney failure is, is advanced. Um, and because Alport syndrome patients tend to be younger and healthier than a typical kidney failure patient, uh, with less diabetes, less problems with heart failure, it'll, it makes transition to dialysis easier. It also makes uh, getting a transplant more feasible. So one of the first things I always recommend to my patients is that they get in, go to an education class, usually when their GFR is less than 30 or at stage 4, chronic kidney disease. Uh, there are classes either through your hospital or through your dialysis unit. Sometimes your nephrologist has uh, staff that will do these classes. And it's really there to learn about what your options are when you go into kidney failure. It talks about transplantation and what it takes to get a transplant. But it also talks about the different modalities of dialysis. And the big things about this is it gets you mentally prepared. So you're engaged, you're educated, and you can help drive your, drive your own care. What it doesn't mean is that you need to start dialysis after your education class. Again, this is advanced planning, so we want to do it long before you need to start dialysis. So what are our options? Well, the best thing, the next best thing to not going into kidney failure is getting a transplant. And we'll talk about why in a second. The other option is hemodialysis. You can either do that in center. Some people do it at night. Some people can do it at home, or peritoneal dialysis. We'll talk about these in detail a lot. But the options allow you to adapt the dialysis to your needs and to your lifestyle. So it's important that when you attend the class, you have an idea of which one you think you might do better with. We'll talk about kidney transplant now. And you know, the first thing is, what do they do? So they take a, they take a donor kidney, either a living donor or someone who's passed away. And they they take it out, and if it's a living donor, that living donor can live with one kidney, and they put it in you. They put it down here in the pelvis. That's called the allograft. The old kidneys won't hurt you if they're left in place, so they leave them in place. It, it, it's way easier than taking them out. Um, so don't, you know, it's a, another common question people ask is if they're going to take the old kidneys out. But because this new kidney is foreign to you, your immune system recognizes it and tries to attack it, and that's what we call rejection. And that's why patients who get a transplant need in, uh, transplant medicines, and they suppress the immune system to try to prevent kidney rejection. So why get a kidney transplant? Well, it's a new kidney, all right? It's the only thing we have that replaces all of the functions of the kidneys that you had. It's the only thing that will clean your blood 24-7 rather than just when you're on dialysis. And it's easier on the body overall. <clears throat> you, most people live longer with a transplant than on dialysis. It provides freedom from dialysis, a big boon to the lifestyle. And it avoids some of the complications that we can see with dialysis. <clears throat> Typically, people can get listed for a transplant when their GFR is less than 20. So workup typically starts at around 20 to 22 percent is when I'll refer my patients over. You can get worked up and then be held on that list until the GFR hits less than 20 and be listed at that point. Now the kidney transplant workup is done often by a dedicated team 
We have transplant nephrologists now, who that's all they do. They're surgeons who do the transplants. They're part of the team. And then you'll meet other people, social workers, care coordinators, uh, mental health experts. <clears throat> and, and the process is that you, as the potential transplant recipient, get evaluated first. Because nothing happens until we are sure that you're healthy enough to receive a transplant. So there will be um, many tests and scans that you'll need to do to clear you. Once you are cleared, you're listed. And then the question becomes, do you have any potential donors? And if you do, then they get brought in and evaluated to see if they're healthy enough to donate a kidney to you. And there are two, as we talked about, there are two types of donations, one from a living donor. It can either be a relative or an unrelated donor or a deceased donor. <clears throat> living donors, living donated kidneys do best. They tend to last the longest. And they last even longer if you can get the transplant before starting dialysis. Believe it or not, that, that, is, that is the best way to go. Uh, if you get that kidney in there before you need dialysis, it tends to live the last the longest. And that's what we call a preemptive transplant. Having a living donor allows you to schedule the transplant surgery. So once everybody's cleared, you and the donor are cleared, then the, the, the team will ask you when you want, want the kidney uh, transplant. And, sometimes a couple of weeks, sometimes working around schedules and maybe a month or two. And it's often not done until the kidney function, the GFR, gets down to around 14 to 16. And, and the thought behind this is, is we don't want to wait until the kidney function is too low so that you get sick from your kidney failure. But you also don't want to do it too early um, when the kidneys are still hanging out around 18 or 20 percent, and you might not need a transplant at that point. But again, the downside of this is that Living donation requires a donor. Finding a donor can be difficult, especially with Alport patients. Be being a genetic disease, a lot of relatives have Alport syndrome, and, and that can rule them out as, as a potential donor. Um, but if, if there is someone who's unaffected, they, they could be worked up. And, uh, you know, we can't say enough about what a heroic measure it is for someone to donate a kidney to somebody else. Um, it, it's really, uh, I think, in medicine, one of the most charitable acts we see um, because it has such a good impact on, on people's lives. And that's where we get into the Good Samaritans. There are living unrelated donors out there, the church members, there's Good Samaritans answering an ad online. Uh, and there are some, there are programs now where they'll do match donations. So if you have somebody that could donate because they don't have Alport syndrome, but they're not a match for you, then they, there's a computer uh, system that can try to link you up with two other people throughout the country who may be able to take your donor's kidney and may have a donor that matches for you. So there's lots of different ways to find donors. Now, if we can't find a donor, that's where we go to what we call the deceased donor kidney transplant. And as I said, as soon as you're cleared for a transplant and your GFR is less than 20, you're listed. And you want to get listed as soon as possible. The minute your GFR hits less than 20, because the, more, the longer you're on the wait list, the better chances are that you're going to get a transplant. And depending on your blood type and where you live in the country, wait times can vary from one to five years or even longer. O positive patients tend to be the longest wait. And because of that, many people end up starting dialysis while they're on the wait list, but they can stay on the, on the wait list and get transplanted after starting dialysis. So going through the matching process, what do we look at? So the first thing we look at is blood type. There are some centers who are doing research protocols with uh, mismatched blood, but that is not the norm at all. Uh, so they look for your blood types, and they also, uh, you don't have to be the same blood type, but there are certain blood types that can't donate to other blood types. And then we look at uh, what we call allergens, and these are proteins that are on the immune cells in the immune system that the immune system will react to. And there are a series of other antibodies in your bloodstream that may react to the organ. This is what we call a uh, PRA, and that's a percent um, that, that's given as a percentile, and that basically tells them what percentage of the population's blood proteins you've reacted to. And uh, certain things can increase your PRA. Having a previous transplant will certainly do that because you've been exposed to somebody's entire organ system. 
Blood transfusions can increase your PRA. So a lot of times when patients are listed for a transplant, they're told not to get a blood transfusion. It's important to avoid them, but on the other side, if it's emergently needed, uh, it, it may still be necessary. We do try to avoid them, though. And then pregnancy can increase your PRA, but that's not something we recommend. You know, if people are dead set on becoming pregnant, um, you know, we, we don't tell them that they can't do that if they want to transplant. But the key is the higher the PRA, the harder it is for you to find a match. And so you may be on the wait list longer if, you're, if your PRA is higher. But once you get matched and you either get a donor or you're on the wait list and you get your kidney, the good thing is at least the Alport syndrome in the kidney at least is cured. The hearing and the visual issues and the other things are not, but the kidney, the Alport will not come back in the new kidney. You're going to be in the hospital for a couple of days to monitor how the new kidney is doing, make sure you're not having a sudden rejection that can happen or there aren't any, weren't any complications from the surgery. That's where you'll also be started on transplant medicines. Oftentimes, they'll front load a strong form of the transplant medicines through the IV, either before or right after the transplant, and start you on a combination of pills to avoid rejection. And these pills need to be taken every day on schedule. So most of them are twice a day. Um, missing a single dose can drop the level of the, the medicine down below the point where, um, that the immune system isn't suppressed anymore and the kidney can start rejecting. And so people who don't take their pills regularly or take them some days and forget others, they're at higher risk of losing their kidney. And you know, after going through all that you've gone through, to get cleared and listed and getting the surgery, it really is a shame to lose it because uh, people aren't taking their medicines on time. After your discharge, you're going to get labs often once a week, and you should have frequent visits to your transplant team up front. And after some, some transplant centers are one year, some transplant centers are three years, they'll often get um, transfer your care over to the local nephrologist, who, uh, especially if you don't live in town. So if you can't get a transplant <clears throat> or you go into kidney failure before you get a transplant, then you need to start dialysis. And I, the next bullet's actually kind of important too because even if you worked up for a transplant and you think you have a donor getting worked up, it's still important to start preparing for dialysis. And, and the reason I say this is it's never good to place your eggs in one basket. Something may happen. You get sick and get knocked off the transplant list or the donor ends up not matching. And if you're going to kidney failure and you haven't prepared, um, life's going to be a little harder. So I often will tell my patients that while I'm referring them for a transplant workup that I'm also going to start preparing for kidney failure if we're getting that close. So we'll talk about the different modali modalities of dialysis now. And we'll start with hemodialysis. That's the most common by far. And the machine here is the dialysis machine. This is the filter here that the blood flows through. So blood comes out of the patient, gets pumped through the machine, through the filter, and then back, goes back into the patient. It's, it's pumped against a fluid called a dialysate, and that basically is a standard fluid that allows the potassium in your blood to come down to more normal levels, the acid to come, to come down to more normal, normal levels. It clears out extra water salt, and other built-up metabolites and toxins. It does not work as well as having kidneys. So even if we're on dialysis and doing well, it's not as good as having, having your own kidneys back. There are different ways to get dialysis. You, most commonly, it's in-center, meaning you go to the dialysis unit three times a week, either a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. Most people require three and a half to four hours, and it's recommended that almost everybody get four hours per treatment um, now. And the reason is, is because your, the machine has to clean out all of the toxins that you've built up in the last 48 to 72 hours within those four hours. So the longer you do it, the better uh, job they'll do. You're going to be weighed before and after your treatment to find out if you've gained water weight since the last treatment. And that determines how much fluid they have to remove with dialysis. And that impacts how, uh, how well you tolerate the dialysis, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And also, because the, the blood is running through that filter, it can tend to clot up or clog up, and so they oftentimes will use something called heparin, which is a blood thinner, to run through the tubing 
and keep it from clotting. Another form of dialysis is home dialysis. And this is where you, you run the machines yourself and you, uh, you put the tubing in your arms and uh, the needles in your arm. And, and um, this is done usually for shorter periods, five to six times per week. Uh, usually done at night, either before bed or um, when you wake up in the morning. This takes a lot of training. So um, this isn't something that you can just start doing. And a lot of people, when they start dialysis, they want to just start on home hemo. And unfortunately, it, obviously, you, you need to be trained to be able to do this safely. Because if, if a needle falls out or you get an infection, you end up in the hospital, then you're back to in-center dialysis. So most people will start with a three times a week dialysis while they're getting trained through the home hemo program. You have to be able to hook yourself up, but it does um, give you some freedom in your lifestyle. Most commonly, you know, not having to either miss work three times a week or, or um, other problems like that. There are some benefits medically as far as you may not have to take as many pills, or, um, but there is no proven benefit that doing dialysis more frequently like this will make you live longer or uh, benefit you, um, you know, from your heart or other, other ways. But some people do do it because they feel better. Again, you're clearing the blood out almost every day, so it's not as much of a jolt on your system. You don't have to clear out two or three days' worth of toxins in your blood, just one or two. The other thing is not everybody has a home hemo program. So uh, if you're interested in home hemo and your nephrologist doesn't have one, you don't feel like you're going to insult him by asking him where you can go to, to look into a home hemodialysis program. Another option is in-center nocturnal dialysis. We call it nocturnal dialysis in nephrology. Believe it or not, some people can come into a dialysis unit and fall asleep while on dialysis in a unit with a bunch of other people. Um, it may not be for everybody, but some people can do it. The nice thing is it's, they're, it's still only three times a week, but they're longer sessions, so it's a little bit easier on the body, and it's kind of a, mi it's kind of a, a midway between the three times a week daytime and the home dialysis because it's longer sessions like home dialysis, but you're not, you don't have to do the dialysis. The nurse is hooking you up, they're managing the machines, and then they take you off, so there's no training time to do this. <clears throat> And again, there's, while it may be easier on the body and improve some things like, like blood pressure and how many pills you have to take, there, there's no in, in, uh, impact on how long you might live. And again, this is another place where, this is another situation where you have to have a dialysis unit that's set up to do this, and not, not a lot of places can. But there are usually a couple around every uh, city that, that can do this. The next thing I want to talk about is, is the access, and that is the bane of um, dialysis patients and dialysis doctors' existence uh, because keeping a good access can be very difficult at times. And what we mean by access is how we get the blood out of your veins into the blood into the dialysis, dialysis machine and then back to the machine or back to your body. Putting needles in your veins may work once or twice, but those small veins won't hold up, and they'll scar down, and then you won't be able to use them. So what we do is we, we create a shunt, is a, a common word for it, and a vascular surgeon needs to do this. It's a same-day surgery. We tend to, I tend to refer patients when their kidney function gets under 20 and it looks like they're getting close. We want at least six months advanced warning to, to get a, a, an access placed. Um, some people will wait till 16 or 17 uh, percent kidney function. The important thing for you to know, we have a, a, a program called Save the Vein. And the more needle sticks you get in the veins of the, uh, ar on the arm that the fistula is going to be placed or the access is going to be placed, um, or if you get blood draws from there or lots of blood pressures, those can traumatize those veins and make it harder for the surgeon to place the fistula. So even around GFRs of 30, and some people are doing it even higher when your kidney function is uh, 40 or 45, they'll ask you to stop getting IVs, blood draws, and blood pressures on your non-dominant arm. So if you're right-handed, the access will they'll try to put the access in your left hand, left arm. So they'll try to put have all your IVs and blood draws and blood pressures in the right arm. <clears throat> so that's something that will help um, you get a successful access. 
Now, there are different kinds of excess, and the gold standard is the fistula. And all a fistula is is when blood flows directly from an artery to a vein. That's what the def medical definition of a fistula is. And why do we like fistulas? They last the longest, and they don't require a lot of procedures to keep them open. And so if we see here on this diagram, the red is the artery and the blue is the vein. Now, this vein was typically draining the hand. And what they'll do is they'll snip it and they'll tie it on the, end of this, on the side of this artery. That high pressure blood flowing through the artery now doesn't have to flow through all those capillaries to get back to the vein. It goes directly into the vein. And that vein, it thickens up and it dilates, and what we call arterializing. And because that vein is dilated and thicker, it can tolerate having needles placed in it to draw the blood out for dialysis. So this is the fistula, and this is what, the, what it looks like when they place the needles in it. So it's a really what we think the ideal. Now, some people can't get fistulas, uh, but if, with proper evaluation, if you can get a fistula, that's the best way to go. Here's a picture of a fistula. It does dilate up, and it's visible, all right? But again, some people don't like that it's visible, and they, they want to avoid it because of that, but that's really not the safest thing to do. It, it's, it's worth getting it. Um, from an infection standpoint, from a mortality standpoint, people live longer that have fistulas than if they have IVs, and we'll talk about those in a second. Well, there's a, obviously if it's the best, it can't be the easiest, right? So we, have, we need a good lead time to getting a fistula in. You need to have evaluation of the veins called a vein mapping. Those are either done in your vascular surgery's off, surgeon's office or in a radiology suite in an ultrasound. Uh, once the fistula is placed, it takes anywhere from two to six months for it to fully dilate before it can be used, and that's what we call a mature fistula. Uh, some people never have their fistula mature, whether it was just placed in too small of a vein or sometimes there are other veins draining that vein that need to be snipped. So if the, after a month or two the fistula is not getting bigger, a lot of times patients will have to go back to the surgeon and have it reoperated on um, to get it to, to allow it to mature. So obviously from the sound of this, this isn't something that can be done last minute. And again, going back to being engaged and trying to prepare for kidney failure before you're, before you're there. So I refer my patients at least six months before um, they need to start dialysis, often longer than that. And what I tell my patients is I'd rather have them with a fistula that's not being used than starting dialysis without a fistula. So I'll have patients that have fistulas 6, 12, 18 months before they start dialysis, and I'm okay with that, and, they just, and you need to understand that it's still the best thing for you. Now, an AV graft is the second option and is the second best choice. And, and grafts are reserved for patients whose veins are too small to have fistulas placed. You have to have a nice big vein to attach to the artery to get it to dilate. And what a graft is, is, is it's basically a Gore-Tex tube that they sew between an artery and a vein. So the blood, instead of flowing through that vein and forming a fistula, it flows through the tube, and that tube is already big, so that's where the needles get placed to draw the blood out. The nice thing about grafts is they can be used pretty quickly after placement, um, often as quickly as two weeks after the swelling is, has uh, gone away from the surgery. They tend not to last as long as fistulas, uh, and they need more procedures to keep them open. Sometimes if they start to clog down, they'll send you to a radiologist who will balloon them open and scrape out the stuff that's built up on the inside. There is a slight infectious risk with grafts because it is a foreign material that's in your body. But they still are better. So here's a graft, all right? So this is a diagram. Here's an artery. Here's the vein. And they just tie the, the, the tubing from there of the artery down in the vein. And that's where they're going to put the needles. Here's what a graft looks like in a patient. You can see this is called a loop graft, and the, the band-aids are covering the, um, the needle, the, where they stuck the, the, the graft with the needles for the dialysis. And if we can't get a fistula, we can't get a graft, or the kidney failure has caught us by surprise, a uh, dialysis catheter is our last choice. And it's what we use when dialysis is needed urgently, and we keep, but we don't have an access. And so this is a catheter. It's placed into your internal jugular vein. And then it's tunneled out through the skin, so it comes down below your collarbone. So it's not, you know, sticking out in your neck. It's sticking out below your shirt line. That's why we call it a tunnel dialysis catheter. And as you, as you can see, it has two, two bores in it, or two um, channels. 
One is to pull the blood out to go to the dialysis machine, and the other is to put the clean blood back into you. All right. The nice thing about dialysis catheters, the only nice thing about dialysis catheters, is they can be used immediately after they're placed, same day. And this is what a dialysis catheter looks like. And there's always going to be a dressing with a dialysis catheter. Well, what are, why do we think it's the, the last choice? Lots of infections because you basically have a tunnel going straight from your skin into your, into your bloodstream. <clears throat> so people um, often will get infections and the catheters either need to be removed or people have to go in the hospital for IV antibiotics. And because it's a longer course of plastic that's very narrow, they can tend to clot off and need to be replaced because of that. People spend the tend to spend more time in the hospital due to complications of getting of the catheters or getting them replaced than with the other um, the other two forms of access. And quite frankly, people don't do as well. You know, they, they look at the first year on dialysis between people who have fistulas and grafts and people who have catheters, and fewer people are alive at the end of first year with a catheter. So again, it's it's not just a um, this, this is real evidence that we want to avoid this if we can. Now, some people have to use catheters. Either they don't have good enough veins for a, a fistula or a graft, or the, the fistulas have clotted off. All the places that some people that have been dialysis for a long time, they end up running out of spaces to put, uh, put the fistulas in the grafts, and so they need, they need catheters. Um, but again, it, it's always going to be our access of last choice. So if we review the different types, we have a fistula, we have a graft, we have a catheter. The fistulas take longer to use, but they have the lowest infection risk. The catheters have the highest infection risk. They need fewer procedures to keep the fistulas open once they're matured. And they have the best impact on your lifespan and your time out of the hospital, whereas catheters have the worst impact on that, the highest impact. Moving on from hemodialysis to something called peritoneal dialysis. And this is basically dialysis in your belly. <clears throat> and it's kind of a foreign concept, and it takes a while to understand what's exactly going on. But you're, you have a lot of intestines all folded up inside your belly. And the membranes that attach your intestines to your body have blood flowing through them. <clears throat> and what peritoneal dialysis does is it uses the membrane that the blood is flowing through as the filter. And so uh, we place a catheter in the belly, and that's placed by a surgeon. And the nice thing about that is it can be used within a couple of weeks of placement. And then they put fluid into your belly through the catheter, and it's left to sit there. And as the blood flows through the blood vessels in the membrane in your intestines, it filters across that membrane, and the clean dialysate fluid becomes less clean, but it cleans your bloodstream at, that, at the same time. And it removes the water and the potassium, the salt, the acid, everything else, all those toxins we talked about through the, through the membrane into the belly fluid. And then what you do is once every, every couple of hours, that fluid has to be drained and replaced with fresh fluid because unlike a dialysis machine, we're not flowing fresh fluid through the system at all times. We're, we're instilling it, we're dwelling it, and then we're removing it and replacing it. This is something you do at home, which is nice. A lot of people like peritoneal dialysis um, because they, can, they don't have to be tied to a dialysis unit. Because you have to manually handle the catheter yourself, and if you don't do it right, there's a big infection risk that you can get something called peritonitis or infection in your belly. People either themselves have to have good vision and manual dexterity so they can hook up the catheter to the, the system themselves or have a family member who's able to do that for them. This is a, a schematic of what peritoneal dialysis looks like. So this is the catheter. It sits down in the belly here. And this is a picture. It's not going to look exactly like this. I'll show you a system in a second. But the fluid drains into the belly. They're both capped off. It dwells for a while. And then as we drain, the dirty fluid uh, drains down into the the bag down here, and then you replace it with more clean fluid. This is a picture of what a dialysis catheter looks like. It usually comes out right around here, either side of the belly, either at the belly button or below. Some people do, do have them placed higher, uh, depending on what their needs are. 
There are two types of PD. As with everything we've talked about, there are multiple ways to get, get to what you want to do. And a lot of it depends on what kind of belly membrane you have, how well it filters, but also what you want. So manual peritoneal dialysis is where you have to connect the system, fill your belly, then you disconnect it, you go about your daily life, go to, go to work, go do whatever, and then every couple of hours you have to drain your belly, refill it, and then disconnect. Some patients do better on this form, um, and some people like doing this one. The other option is a cycler, which is by far the most popular with patients, because the cycler lets the machine do this for you at night while you're sleeping. All you do is connect the system, you connect the catheter to <clears throat> what we call a Y connector set that has, it's connected both to the clean fluid and the drain at the same time. And there's a machine that will fill your belly for you at a prescribed volume, and then it will wait, and then it will drain for you at the same time, and after it's done draining, it will refill you. So patients turn this on, they lay down, they go to sleep. After a period of time, often eight, 10 hours, they disconnect from it because dialysis is done. And because this, this is doing the work for you, not while you're at work or while you're about your daily life, but at home while you're asleep and you don't have to do every exchange, you just have to do the initial hookup and the, and the takedown, uh, this is the most popular form with most patients. And your nephrologist will try to work with you and try to get the cycler to work for, with you if that's really what you want, um, and, or what we call nocturnal dialysis. So they really, they really try to get, the, the, first, the first thing is to get you to decide to do PD. We try to get as many people on PD as possible. Um, for a lot of reasons, um, people tend to live a little longer in chemo after a long time, and it's also easier on the healthcare system to do peritoneal dialysis. So this is a picture of the cycler. Okay, so these are the waste bags down here, and here's where the, the bag of clean fluid would sit. It's on a scale, so it can tell when, it, um, when it's put in the right amount. <clears throat> and this is how you connect the, the tubing up to your dialysis catheter. And this is something you need to be trained to do by your peritoneal dialysis unit. They come in and they have you do the dialysis for a couple of weeks to make sure that you can do this cleanly because it, it requires strict sterility um, to keep that from getting infected because that's, a, again, it's a direct tube right into your belly. And if it gets infected, your belly can get infected and you end up in the hospital. All right, so we talked a little bit, but you know, the, the big question is when do you start dialysis? Um, a lot of doctors used to, and fewer do it now, but some still do, they, they started at a magic number and they would say, okay, your kidney function is less than 15, it's time to start dialysis. Well, there's data now to suggest that you don't need to do that. Um, there's no magic number. It's, it's when you need it because you start feeling sick, all right? Um, mo for most people, that's around a GFR of 10 to 12 or 8 to 12 <clears> percent. <throat> and we, we want to do it when you start to feel sick, not when you're feeling really horribly. So you should have more frequent visits to your nephrologist every one to two months, um, and they should be asking you, how's your appetite? Are you getting nauseated? How about when you wake up in the morning? Does, do, do you feel sick or when you, you feel hungry and you smell food and then it just turns your stomach? Or are you getting a bitter or metallic taste in your mouth? Those are signs of early uremia. And we want to start then because if we wait until the symptoms get too severe, you end up throwing, you come in throwing up to the emergency room um, and you have to start as an inpatient. If you start having twitching or, or sleepiness or hiccups, those are actually precursors, precursors to seizures and then we need to start very urgently if the kidneys stop urinating as well, then um, you can develop heart failure. So these are all much more dangerous symptoms when we try to start before people develop them. So the best time is when you start to feel slightly uh, sick. And once you start getting close, you show, so you should have an axis in hopefully by that, by that time. But if you don't, again, you need a catheter. And that's also the time to start looking at where you're going to get dialyzed. Now, most people, their nephrologist has a series of dialysis units they will go to. Go and visit them, make sure you like it, make sure it's clean. Um, you can visit even if you're not on dialysis, say your prospective patient that, that's looking for a dialysis unit. Um, but most people will go to one of the units close to their house that their nephrologist rounds on. Um, most people do stop urinating six to 12 months after starting dialysis. It's a very weird concept um, just to, to stop peeing altogether, but the kidneys do, uh, do eventually shut down in, in most people. And as you do that, 
it becomes very difficult to drink a lot of fluids because everything you drink in between dialysis, they have to take out with dialysis, and that can make it much harder on your body. So uh, most dialysis units will tell you to restrict your fluid intake. And it also becomes more important to, to watch the diet. The diet can be very difficult uh, because we have to watch protein and phosphorus intake as well as potassium and sodium. And you're going to end up with more medicines. It's just the nature of being on dialysis. There are medicines called FOS binders that you take with your food to try to keep the phosphorus from getting absorbed into the bloodstream. You're going to get injections with your dialysis to keep your um, blood counts up to prevent anemia, and most people have heart more difficult to control blood pressure. And it's important not to skip dialysis sessions because it makes it harder on you to catch up. Uh, you gain more weight. You have more toxins built up in your system. And contrary to popular belief, you still can work on dialysis. It is not a reason to go on disability if you're still functional and can make it to your job. And you can still be listed for a transplant, even if you're not listed before you start. And if you start on hemodialysis and you decide you want to switch to peritoneal dialysis or vice versa, you can do that. Just talk to your nephrologist. So in summary, no one wants to start dialysis. No one wants to get a transplant. Your doctors don't want to start you on dialysis. They don't want to give you a transplant. But unfortunately, as kidney failure develops, we don't have any other options at this point. So it's better to prepare, to be educated, to closely follow with your nephrologist so that the transition to kidney failure can be smoother, so you can stay engaged, be an active partner in your care, and help decide what type of uh, kidney replacement you want, whether it's a transplant, hemodialysis, or peritoneal dialysis. And again, it's really important to emphasize to try to get a transplant, if at all possible. Thanks. Ah, thank you so much. Um, I know that I found that very helpful. I'm sure everyone participating live and uh, watching online did as well. We have a couple of questions already. If you have a question, please feel free to type it into the participant feedback section. Um, online and also as I mentioned before I will be unmuting all lines so people can ask questions if you are watching this after the live recording and you have questions you can um, email them to info at alportsyndrome.org the first question you've answered um, if an option would you recommend transplantation for dialysis and I believe that you said the answer is yes are there any barriers to that in terms of insurance or anything health-wise um. Well, health-wise, if you're, if you're going to be healthy enough to get cleared for a dialysis or a transplant, you're more likely to be the healthiest before you start dialysis. So, um, and then from insurance, they'll go over it with you, the insurance issues. Um, you know, once you start dialysis, you qualify for Medicare regardless of your age, and the same with a transplant. Now, the transplant, it only lasts a couple of years, but dialysis, once you're on dialysis, you're on on um, Medicare. So the question is whether your current insurance will cover transplant evaluation. That's something that's really company by company and then your transplant um, group will evaluate that and go over it with you if there's going to be any out-of-pocket costs. Great. What prolonged, um, sorry, can prolonged dialysis increase the likelihood of transplant rejection? It shouldn't um, because your dialysis in itself, you're not getting exposed to other people's proteins. They're going to increase the risk of you having that high PRA level that we talked about. But being on dialysis, a lot of people need transfusions, and that can increase the risk or, um, you know, end up getting sick. And um, it, basically, the longer you're on dialysis, the harder it is to get a transplant, but it doesn't make it impossible. What are the common factors that would prevent a recipient from being a transplant candidate? Usually either they're too old or they're too sick. All right, so people with bad heart failure, bad hearts that they may need a heart transplant at the same time or they have bad enough heart that they can't get a heart transplant or can't get a kidney transplant. They basically want to make sure that once you get this priceless organ placed into you, you're going to live long enough to benefit from it. They obviously don't want someone to have a heart attack on the, on the operating table. I don't want to be crass about it, but they, they, they don't want people to die in the operation. They don't want people to get really ill afterwards and um, having taken a kidney out of a donor and, um, you know, people end up not doing well. So they're really they're looking for how well can you tolerate the surgery and how likely you are to be healthier as a result of the kidney transplant. So the biggest thing that we run into is um, it, it varies by transplant centers. We have a cutoff of around 70. Some people will transplant older than that. But as you get into like 80 years old, 
you actually don't live any longer with a transplant than with dialysis in most cases. So, um, you know, the, the older population, not necessarily as germane to the Alport syndrome uh, population, but the older population often won't qualify. And then if you have any untreatable or unstable diseases, you know, active cancer, you have to be free of cancer for a certain amount of time, depending on the cancer, uh, to, to get listed for a transplant, and heart issues are another big one. Great. I have a question that comes up in the support group page quite a bit, and um, I'm not sure if anybody would, would ask it in this setting, but some men have asked about challenges, um, side effects with dialysis um, of erectile dysfunction. Is that something that is common? Yes, there are lots of side effects with dialysis. Erectile dysfunction, basically erectile dysfunction in most patients is, a, is a evidence of vascular dysfunction. And so being on dialysis, your, your, your increased risk of vascular disease, the, the, the blood vessels don't work as well, they don't, they're not as pliable, they become harder. And so, um, you know, erectile dysfunction is one manifestation of that. And as well, being without kidneys, whether it's the fact that you're in kidney failure or you're on the dialysis machine, your hormones get a little out of whack. And so, um, you know, your testosterone balance might, might be impaired as a result of that as well. But, you know, other symptoms, Depression is very common on dialysis, and it's, it's important to recognize that. Um, fatigue, um, you, can, you can feel washed out sometimes after dialysis. Some people are more susceptible to that than others, especially if your blood pressure tends to drop during dialysis. Um, but no, yeah, erectile dysfunction can, can definitely be a side effect. Um, and a question, um, for a living donor, what are the risk factors and what is the procedure like for them? So they're doing laparoscopic procedures now. So it's the, the, the patients, you know, they used to, when they do open, open um, nephrectomies or removing the kidney through a big, big um, incision, they often would take the lower rib out on the side that they were removing the kidney from. So the patient not only donated a kidney, but they donated a rib. Um, and that, you know, left them with, obviously, issues of not having a rib there. Um, sometimes that can hurt or just feel weird. But they can do them laparoscopically now where they put a, a couple different holes in the belly and they use instruments to pull the kidney out through a very tiny hole. It's amazing that they can compress the kidney down. Um, and that's, a, in general, easier on the person who's donating the kidney. Um, there's always risk to, to surgeries, which is why they try to evaluate patients and make sure they're healthy enough to donate. So it's making sure they're healthy enough to get through the surgery as well as healthy to live with one kidney. So, um, but the, it's usually a, I think it's an overnight stay. Um, I'm not certain on that for the donor. And then they usually have one or two visits to follow up to make sure that they're doing okay after the procedure. Thank you. I'm going to unmute the lines. So if anybody the has- The conference has been unmuted. Please um, feel free to ask them now um, via your phone. Great. Well, it seems as though there are no questions here, but if anybody has any questions now or in the future, you can feel free to email us at info at alportsyndrome.org, and we will make sure to pass them along to Dr. Simon or whoever is appropriate to answer questions. I'd also like to um, say that obviously everything we've been speaking about here, Dr. Simon mentioned um, that depression and anxiety can be side effects of, of all of these treatments. Um, the Alport Syndrome Foundation does have resources for helping you cope with these, including our peer mentor program, where you would be matched one-on-one -on -one with someone who's already gone through this and can kind of help you through um, the process, talk to about any challenges you're having, give you some resources and just some emotional support while you're going through it. We also have our family meetings where you would have the opportunity to meet with people who are sharing the same experience that you have and are um, or have been through before and you have the opportunity to, to have that connection. So I encourage you to look on our website if, if these are things that you are interested in. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simon. This is really helpful and very informative. And I know it will be a wonderful resource for 
well, hopefully not for too many years to come because we are working to conquer Alport syndrome and eliminate the need for these things for kidney patients. Um, however, in the meantime, it'll be a great resource for those. Um, it will be available on our website. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.